Hi, everybody. I hope you had a great weekend. This week for Million Dollar IRA, I thought I would talk about a technical indicator, RSI, that I found myself a bit reluctantly paying attention to as I was evaluating a stock that's on my watch list. And I thought it might be interesting or helpful to you. Why was I reluctant? Well, because it's a technical indicator and I am not a technician and I've never conducted what would be called technical analysis. My training is more traditional or on the fundamental side. I have a chartered financial analyst, CFA. It took me three years to get that. And sure, technical analysis in the syllabus or at the time that I studied was in the syllabus, but not really in a big way. In the meantime, I've taught the financial risk manager, FRM, for over a decade. And I've also written many articles for Investopedia, but really along the lines of valuation or fundamental analysis or financial analysis, where I would say in those schools of thought, really it, there's a bias against technical analysis. That's why, just for example, I put up here an image of something that's straight out of textbook FRM, but also CFA about the efficient market hypothesis. You've probably heard of the efficient market hypothesis. It's debatable. It's controversial. And really there's not just a yes, no, answer to whether market are markets efficient, I would go so far to say that most experts, including finance professors, probably have a nuanced or in-between view. But efficient market hypothesis very briefly has three forms, starting with the weak. The weak form of the theory says that if markets are weakly efficient, it means that current market stock current stock prices already incorporate or impound any of the information in their past prices. So that if you believe markets are weakly efficient, then it's logical to conclude that technical analysis adds no value, cannot produce any alpha. And that's just where it starts in the weak form, right? If we go to semi-strong, semi-strong efficient market hypothesis theory says that the current stock price already incorporates all public information. And if you believe that, it's logical to conclude that fundamental analysis, that is to say like analyzing the financial statements, really doesn't add any value, wouldn't generate alpha. The strong form says also, additionally, these are all additive, private information is incorporated into the current stock price. And this gets pretty fatalistic. And I think it's fair to say that the logical conclusion, if you believe that markets are strongly efficient, I think it's fair to say you, can, you could conclude that all of the active management industry basically does not add value. And I think there are some people who feel that way. But I just wanted to show you this efficient market hypothesis to show you that even the weak form or greater is really opposed to the notion that technical analysis, including now the chart, is, adds any value and wouldn't support using something like the relative strength indicator that I found myself looking at in this context here with this stock, Tanger uh, Factory Outlets. It's been on my watch list because I follow Brad Thomas, who's an expert in real estate investments, such REITs, of which this is one. And this gets, uh, Tanger gets associated with uh, shopping centers and malls, although they're uh, uh, direct factory outlets. You can see here about 40 locations, according to their investor uh, presentation, locations mostly in the east and in the south. And then what's interesting uh, about them to me as a follower on, reeking out, on Seeking Alpha, where uh, I, I believe there's a lot of smart, informed uh, buyers, there's been a lot over the last year, a lot of uh, bullish recommendations to buy this stock, and in many cases, some strong justifications after all. The fundamental story is actually pretty strong. Just for example, I'm not going to go into detail here because I'm actually not making a bull case as evidenced by the fact that I have not uh, purchased the stock. It just remains on my watch list. My purpose here is to explain to you why I'm not buying it on technical grounds, actually, which is sort of new for me. But the in terms of Tang, uh, a Tanger Factory Outlet, uh, we have some a stock, a company here that uh, in fundamentals uh, performs quite well. The dividend growth of the last 25 years, they have increased their dividend in every year of the last 25 years. Also, at, during that time period, the occupancy rate has never dropped below 95%. 
in the last quarter that they just turned in, the uh, same store NOI, net operating income, was only negative 5%, which was an improvement. And you can see getting pretty close to flat NOI, which considering the conditions is, uh, I think, very impressive. The yield you can see is 8.6%, which is a mouth-watering yield. And then also the valuation case has been made very strongly because the uh, the in the REITs, the analog to the PE multiple is the price to funds from operations, FFO. And they're at about, looks to me like, well, they're at about 7.3, which is about half, I'll just go about half their historical average of 15 times. And then when I looked at just a, a rough peer set to uh, Tanger factory outlets, could be variously defined, but I got uh, 12 to 15 um, as sort of competitive multiples on the price to funds from operations, again, the analog to PE in the REIT world. So that just on a naive multiple basis, they look cheap. And contrary to what the chart might suggest, their fundamentals are really not deteriorating. I think it can be easier to make a, a, a positive or bull case than it would be to make a bear case. The trigger for me was in the last, uh, just in the last week, yet more positive articles. Here's just two of the headlines. Uh, doubling down on this undervalued 8.6% yielding REIT and then an 8% recession resilient dividend yield because on a fundamental valuation case, I absolutely have to agree and would have for months been agreeing with these arguments in favor of buying this stock. Okay, but why wouldn't I at this moment? Well, momentum, actually, I have to admit. And so here's just a bit on factor theory. This is also in the FRM. Factor theory builds on capital asset pricing model. So here's a four-factor model, but the first one is really uh, built, uh, really a variation on cap, uh, cap M or capital asset pricing model which says that you basically get compensation in your returns. Uh, you get your, your uh, returns and ex or excess returns are compensation for exposure to a uh, common risk factor, a common market factor, in this case, the market premium. But then the Fama French model came along and added two factors here. This SMV is the uh, small cap or size factor. I should call that the size factor. And then this uh, HML is the value factor. So the Fama French model is uh, really famous in academic circles for these three factors. But here, this size factor, this is small minus big. If this is true, it basically says you get deserved excess returns for the compensation that you bear by, by purchasing or being long in small capitalization stocks. So this is the extra return due to the small size effect. And then this is value. This is uh, where, where uh, high minus low is uh, book to uh, market, ratio book to market. And so this is really on a uh, book value basis, this factor is compensation for buying cheap stocks. So if this factor is true, it's really a defense or a justification or an affirmation of a value as opposed to growth style. And then, but there's a, another factor, WML, which is the momentum factor. This is compensation for uh, momentum. And I'm just going to, this is from Andrew Eng. And uh, so I'm just going to quote from him on momentum investing. So that's a reference to this factor here. Momentum investing involves going long in stocks that have moved up, i.e. winners, in a particular period, and shorting stocks that have gone down, i.e. losers, over, a same, over the same period. This is based on the premise. Here's, the, here's really the summary of it. This is based on the premise that winners will continue to win while losers will continue to lose. That's the momentum idea. Winners continue to win. Losers continue to lose. The trend, uh, to some extent, continues. The trend itself is predictive. 
The momentum factor risk is described by WML, which stands for winners minus past losers. Finally, he says, momentum is noticed across every asset class like equities, commodities, government bonds, corporate bonds, and real estate. And I also did want to check and see what the CFA says about momentum, about price momentum, and this is what the CFA says. Research have also found a strong price momentum effect in almost all asset classes in most countries. In fact, value and price momentum have long been the two cornerstones of quantitative investment investing. Um, this price momentum anomaly is commented, commonly attributed to behavioral biases, such as overreaction to information. So my the way that I would read that is the CFA in summary is in the literature. It's basically saying we have observed the momentum anomaly, which is to say that winners tend to win, losers tend to lose, although we could explain it with behavioral biases such as overreaction to information. And I suppose you could include in that following the herd or trend following some of these behavioral biases. Nevertheless, they find it. Only interesting thing they add is price momentum is subject to extreme tail risk. So if we want to get efficient about it and summarizing what I think the CFA is saying, I think they're saying the momentum factor is real, but maybe on a risk adjusted basis, it washes out. Okay, so that's a bit on the theory as momentum as a factor alongside the size and value as sort of established, if not controversial factors. I just want to share with you that Andrew Ng, uh, which is the textbook in the FRM or uh, significantly assigned in, in the FRM, how does he summarize what the findings on momentum in terms of the literature and his own experiments? I don't have to go very far. This is the sentence. Momentum returns blow size and value out of the water. Uh, this, this is not a gossip columnist uh, casually making this statement that Andrew Ang has made a um, methodical study here of, uh, of the literature and of his own experiments. This is a serious statement by a researcher. And so the, the momentum effect, well, going back to Tanger factory, factory Outlets and why I wanted to share this, why it's on my watch list is because I follow Brad Thomas, who I consider one of the world's experts on REITs and published so often on Seeking Alpha. What I'm showing here is not a criticism of him. Um, I am not qualified to criticize him. After all, uh, I've made excellent REIT uh, purchases based on his recommendation. So I, but um, it's still interesting that in the short run, how his thesis has been overwhelmed by momentum. Right. These are basically headlines over the last uh, year um, where he's been he's put forth the justifiable argument for buying this stock. Right. Going back to August 3rd, 2018, it's 10 it's Tanger Tanger time. And then uh, October 2018, November uh, again, it's uh, Tanger time and then December 7, 2018, Tango remains a beautiful swan, and that's when it was here at about 24.36. So this is just my attempt to do a really quick mini case study here on an interesting phenomenon, right? Here in December, it's a beautiful swan, and um, what we just have here, as far as what I can tell from the fundamentals of what the company reported, it's mostly just a negative sentiment story, right? I don't, I don't see anything in here that any anything that he fundamentally made a little of that's incorrect. All seems to be completely correct. Okay, so we have a drop, um, and then February twentieth, this pure play outlet read is an absolute bombshell strong buy. At that point, February, it's twenty fifty four. Uh, bombshell buy, and then by April, let's see, April, we're at uh, 2027, and then May 14th, uh, superior investors strive to behave as contrarians. So uh, getting the purchase recommendation up to until, uh, let's say, on Friday, it looks like it closes at uh, 
16.12, where now he has it as a strong buy, and uh, as do others. And, of course, I do not mean any criticism here, except to say that I'm glad I didn't listen at 24, and I'm glad I didn't listen at 16. And now um, I'm not still not buying here, despite the fact that I am convinced by the fundamentals and by the valuation, right? The price to the price to uh, FFO multiple is very low. It looked I like cheap stocks, and the the company is not deteriorating. In fact, it looks like it has growth prospects. My problem is uh, the overwhelming negative sentiment and the fact that in one of these articles, I thought one of the commenters made the point that that I sort of. Uh, would uh, meditate on. They asked, why now? Why would we purchase this stock now, right? Given that earlier buyers have lost so much. And I think that's the right question. If there's any truth to the momentum, right? Because why now means why not wait until momentum termed positive? What's the harm in that? That would sort of be my view. Well, what's the worst? The, the worst risk you could take is that the stock's going to unexpectedly and quickly uh, jump positive. But that seems to me to be much less of a risk than actually catching a falling knife. Where unfortunately, those of us who would prefer to live in only a fundamental world, right? I would prefer to think that. I would prefer to think that as of this point in time, the past st- this past year is irrelevant. Um, but to the extent it reflects overwhelming negative sentiment and lack of any demand for the shares, it's hard, it's hard to say that that negative sentiment has no, uh, viability and that this might not be, that this could be a falling knife with, you know, further losses. So, I, I would agree with the one commenter that says, why now? Where the corollary seem, to me seems to be, why not? Even if you like it, why not wait until momentum turns positive? And so it's for that reason that uh, point of this video, I found myself for the first time ever looking at the momentum indicators, which for years I've completely ignored. But if we take Anger Factory Outlets, this is from Stockopedia. And they also let you look at the 14-day, here's the 14-day RSI. And it's worth the, um, just quickly defining what these uh, RSI is. So it's pretty simple. If we go back and look at like the one-year relative strength, then they're going back one year and indexing both the uh, stock and the market index. And, and uh, they don't actually say in this case what the market index is. If it's, is it the overall market or is it a sector? That choice would be important. But the index to 100, both the stock and its benchmark, let's call it. And over the one year, if let's say uh, it looks like Tanger uh, indexed would have dropped to 80 and its benchmark, let's say, would have gone to uh, 120. So 80 over 20 becomes the ratio subtracting one, and we have negative uh, 0.33 or negative 33%. And so that's the uh, RSI indexed on a one-year basis if we go back and start at a a one-year prior. And so the RSI, the choice of the uh, time frame or window going back matters a lot to the input. But you can see the calculation is very simple here, and it is relative, meaning that uh, a stock could drop, but its benchmark could drop more such that its relative strength would still be positive, right? That's not the case here. Dangers drop a lot, and uh, but that's it's been much worse than its benchmark dropped. So its relative here is... One year and three months, both of those, you know, that three months, negative 25%. One year is negative 35%. Uh, This is very negative uh, relative strength, negative momentum. And are are these metrics meaningful? 
I, I can't tell you that I have great confidence that they mean anything, right? If, if even that weak form of ambition market hypothesis is correct, logically, the, this relative strength is irrelevant, right? Because these are bit, this is a ratio based on past prices. If weak form efficient markets is valid, RSI is a meaningful and, and ultimately distracting statistic. On the other hand, if this strong negative momentum and negative sentiment, I'm using them synonymously, is reflective of some overwhelming sentiment that has uh, that's a trend that would continue, uh, it seems to me a, a good enough reason to not purchase the stock and simply to wait for uh, sentiment to, to return to be positive. So for me, the key uh, probably is, do I think the momentum is actually descriptive of some underlying fundamental narrative? Because I would like, like to go back to fundamentals. And that's what, uh, finally, I would say, I have two stocks where I think momentum, momentum indicators would be uh, would have been valid reflective indicators. Uh, one is Lennar, the home builder. Uh, and this chart goes back here. Uh, Lennar peaked at the beginning of 2018. And then I made my first purchase. If this is interesting, I made my first purchase. Uh, looks like when the stock was $53 in May of 2018. And... And then um, what I would say about that and reflection is I was actually keenly aware of the fact that Lennar was, a, was, ba was treated firstly as a home builder in the home builder sector. So judged firstly as a home builder and secondly on its own um, individual attributes. And so at the time I was keenly aware of the negative sentiment at the middle of 2018 when I bought it. I just didn't care. It's just not part of my calculation. Um, that negative sentiment had a lot to do with the macroeconomic perspective, but especially uh, interest rates, right? Uh, we're in a rising interest rate regime where the Fed was uh, increasing the uh, short interest rate and also concerns about uh, the new tax laws effect on housing and affordability. So those twin worries of uh, uh, affordability and interest rate were weighing on the whole uh, home building sector as negative sentiment for the whole year. I was keenly aware of that, but it's not uh, part of my fundamental uh, analysis. So I didn't really let it impact my timing. And then at the end of the year, as part of the uh, December sell-off, uh, I ended up double down in two separate tranches uh, at 30, looks like at 37.44 and then at 42.91, right? So I have about three purchases such that my looks like my weighted cost is about forty five twenty. My is my cost basis, and the stock uh, closed Friday fifty one fifty three. So I'm I'm positive. Let's see, I'm up thirteen. I happen to be up thirteen point seven percent on my uh, Lennar, but uh, you can see underwater relative to my initial purchase. So I I'm at a, I'm at a almost fourteen percent gain only because I. Uh, you know, I uh, average down here with these two additional purchases. Really, in what retrospect looks like the looks like a bottom. I didn't know at the time, but but all I will say is that uh, momentum indicators here would have been um, would have been negative here relative to general market index, and that wouldn't be random, right? That would have genuinely reflected um, negative sentiment that I can trace to specific macroeconomic reasons. And you know, so sure, in hindsight. I wish I waited a little longer for that purchase, but you know, can't market time. And then in the other case, going in the other direction, uh, Bank of America is a stock here I first bought uh, near the end of 2016, and I have a, a considerable gain on this, mostly because uh, uh, end of 2000, uh, 2017, mostly we saw a run up here where I would say again, going in another direction, that positive momentum indicators would have been reflective of a positive sentiment that had a, a genuine underlying narrative, right? In this case, uh, Bank of America had sort of languished here for a while, and then at least my, my thesis at the time was twofold. It was uh, right after the 
uh, what news about the Wells Fargo broke, and I felt B of A would uh, uh, benefit from that. But also, like everybody else, I knew that the Fed had telegraphed they were, we were heading into an, uh, uh, a, a regime of interest rate increases, which they did, and and those are generally perceived to be beneficial to banks. Right, the Fed raises interest rate, steeper yield curve. That benefits banks who tend to uh, invest or lend long and borrow short, but the but the borrowing short rates tend to be sticky with depositors. So that, that's good for the bank's net interest margin, uh, rising interest rate regimes. Uh, sort of the inverse of the same thing that might be a, a concern if the Fed is going to uh, into a cut rate environment. But knowing, so I had two good reasons, and uh, including knowing we were going into a Increase rate environment um, for the bank to uh, benefit that I already felt was under, under, uh, under, undervalued. So everything was lining up at the time that I got that. And then, sure enough, the rate increases came um, in sequence, right? Uh, December 2016, that's right about here, uh, 50 basis points to 75 basis points. March 2017, 75 to 100 basis points. This is the uh, federal funds rate. June 2017, right about here, uh, 100 to 125 basis points. And then December 2017, uh, to 125 to 175 basis points. And then, okay, just March 2018, 150 to 175 basis points. You can see... Had a one, uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, twenty-five basis point increases into a, a the the width of the range is twenty-five basis points. But so we saw the rate increase regime, and what's interesting to me, um, and and then we ended up here in a scenario where more recently where where B of A along uh, uh, according to typical peer-based metrics is more closely fairly valued. And in hindsight, here undervalued. But what's interesting to me here, there's a full year where, um, and it, you know, uh, there there was no uh, immediate rush. You could have benefited from that momentum at almost uh, any point in time during the year. It was uh, it was just it was gradual momentum for the most part. And so that's just my illustration of where I do think, uh, you know, you'd take a momentric momentum at any point in time there. Um, or for matter, or for that matter, before and after, those would have uh, been at least partly informed by uh, a pervasive sentiment that has behind it a viable narrative. And so, for that reason, you know, I've been inclined to, in these instances, I would have been inclined to attach some significance to the momentum indicator. So, what, all I'm saying there is that I could tell a story at least in retrospect about why those why the momentum indicator was positive here and negative in the Lennar case however with that said finally in terms of what I would what I can do with it I'm not doing anything with our our RSI when it's improving right so when we're going like we're going up um how why because what would that that would in, inform a decision to sell the winner and what I've been doing more recently with my winners is what I did and discussed in my last video. Um, I have two big winners, uh, Q2 and Alteryx. Uh, Alteryx, just a phenomenal winner. Two I had a very big gains on. And in my last video, I talked about how I took a, I, I, I sold a little bit of the position, took a little bit off the table, but, but retained, uh, retained stakes in those companies. And since then, um, Alteryx defies gravity and has gone up even higher, uh, inexplicable. So it's very rich now. So sort of uh, that's where I'm falling out. I'm not, I didn't factor an RSI or momentum into that decision. That decision more about risk management in two winners that had, had it showed a positive momentum. I was taking games off the table, that's all, just to lock in some of the games and, and staying in with the rest. RSI didn't inform that, but what I am saying is that on the on the negative, um, in that situation here with Tanger Factory Outlet, 
I mean, at least currently where I am in my evolution as an investor, I am I am going to look at it on the negative. And a, 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 a company like uh, Tanger Factory Outlet, uh, where where otherwise the fundamentals and the valuation are supportive of a purchase, um, when the, I am going to look at, a, on, at this as an avoidance signal, as a something that says, um, you know, I'm going to I'm just going to wait and see if there's a change in settlement uh, and in sentiment, and uh, and wait and then reevaluate it at that point in time. So that's my current uh, thinking about the role of any momentum, and I hope that's helpful. If it is helpful. Please subscribe to the channel and you'll get notified of my next video. Thank you.